Colossians chapter 3, Psalm 119. A lot of things Pastor said this morning in the sermon uh, ties in nicely with some of the things we're going to talk about this evening. And it's a blessing when the Lord does that, puts it together. Also, some of the music, the special music, all fits in nicely to what we're going to be talking about this evening. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we pray before we start? Brother Steve, could you please pray for us? Well, I want to preach to you tonight about a proper marriage. Um, can't possibly cover everything the Bible has to say about it in one night. It's quite a topic. But we're going to focus in about what the Bible says about it from the perspective of Colossians. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. So why don't we start reading in verse number 18, Colossians chapter 3, verses 18. And 18 and 19 is going to be our subject tonight, but we're going to go all the way down to verse 25. Verse, Colossians chapter 3, verse number 18, the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord... Ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Now I read the end of the chapter because verses 18 to 25 is all part of the same thought. And the same instructions that the Lord gives to wives and husbands are the same instructions that the Lord gives to fathers, servants. Oh, they're different instructions, but they've got one thing in common. What we do, we do it for the Lord. And um, so we're going to preach about a, a marriage tonight, proper marriage from Colossians chapter 3. And I've already told, I've already told Emily exactly when she's supposed to say amen to make it look good. No, I haven't really. But, <laughs> uh, no, we're, we haven't done that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the reason, um, the, reason, the reason Christians go to the world for counsel, whether it's a marriage uh, issue or relationship or anything else, usually it's because they already know what the Bible says and they're not interested in doing it. And so they want somebody else to give them some other advice that will make them feel good um, because they already know what the Bible says and they're not interested in doing it. They don't want to do it. And why would you go to the world? Why would you go to the world for advice when you could go to God? Amen. Look at Psalm 119. We'll come, back to, we'll come right back to Colossians. But look at Psalm, 1, Psalm 119 and verse 128. 119 and 128. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. So the Bible says that the Lord's right about everything. Uh, that's a blessing, because uh, at one point in your life, sooner or later, sooner or later you're going to need answers to pretty much everything that you come up against. And the Lord says everything He has to say is right. Now, if you had a problem with your, uh, there was a plumbing problem in your house, you wouldn't call an auto mechanic. I mean, that wouldn't make sense. If you had a problem with the plumber, you'd call the plumber. If you had a problem with your car, you wouldn't call tech support for your computer, right? I mean, everybody's got their own little area of expertise. But if we're honest, 
once you, we get beyond that, we're pretty much clueless about most other things. We might know one thing or two things, or if you're really smart, you might know a few things. But there's really, it's pretty limited our area of knowledge and our area of expertise. But you know what the Lord says? I'm right about everything. All, everything I talk about, I'm right about. Uh, when I, the Lord says, when I talk about science, I'm right about it. When I talk about history, I'm right about it. When I talk about prophecy, I'm right about it. When I talk about how you should live your practical everyday life, I'm right about it. You know what the Lord says? I'm the expert in everything. So why would you go to anyone but the Lord? The Bible, uh, you read over in Isaiah chapter 30 and Isaiah chapter 31, and you know what the Lord rebukes His people for? He rebukes them for taking counsel, but not of Him, and getting and seeking help from some other source but Him. He says, why are you going to Egypt for your help and your counsel? Egypt's the type of the world. Why do Christians who claim they have the infallible words of God go to the world for advice and counsel? You know when you do that, you know what you're telling the world? You're telling, you're te when, you, when you forsake what the Bible says to go ask the world counsel, you know what you're doing? You're telling that lost person that God doesn't have all the answers and that's why I'm here to hear from you. What kind of testimony is that? Are you going to then turn around and witness to that person and say, look, the Lord has all the answers? Clearly you went to them because in your eyes God didn't have all the answers. That's why you went to them. So how are you going to turn around and try to witness to them and say that you have what they need? <laughs> it doesn't work. The Bible says, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. You know, whether or not you esteem it to be right, it is right. Yeah. Whether or not you agree with God, He is right. He doesn't need anyone to second the motion. He's not looking for anyone to agree with Him so He can feel better about Himself. He is right. But His truth is not going to help you unless you esteem it to be right. It's right whether or not you agree with it, but it's only going to be a help and a benefit to you if you get on board and agree with it. He says at the end of the verse, and I hate, I hate every false way. And that's, that's a lot of times that's where the rubber meets the road. And um, we, have, we live in a really weird modern Christianity that promotes, you know, that you should love everything indiscriminately. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says love the good and hate the evil. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians lack real victory in their life because they agree with God about what He says is right, but they don't hate what He says is wrong. You know, if you really hated something, you'd get rid of it. You know, the, the, you know, the reason we hold on to sins in our life, if we're honest, is because we don't hate, hate it. If we hated it, we'd get rid of it. The reason we harbor certain thoughts and ideas and sins and habits in our life is because maybe we dislike it at times, but we don't hate it. And God hates it. And He says, and I hate, I hate every false way. You believe, you believe that obeying the Word of God, believing and obeying the Word of God and putting it into practice in your life, you believe that that is the way to have a successful, happy Christian life? You believe that? So wouldn't it make sense to hate anything that would take away that happiness and away that blessing and away that joy? I mean, if you're going to love what gives you the blessing, wouldn't it make sense to hate what would take it away? And I think, I think sometimes we're really blind to the lack of joy and the lack of peace that we could have if we really obeyed the Lord and submitted to Him. And if we could see, if we could see all the, th all the things that sin robs us from, all the things it takes from us, I think we hate it more than we do. Yeah. Go back to Colossians chapter 3. You say, what's all that got to do with our passage? If you could have a wonderful and great marriage, why would you settle for less than that? Amen. Why, if you could have a wonderful marriage that pleases the Lord, shouldn't it make sense to hate whatever is robbing you of that good marriage and taking away the joy of a good marriage? Now, if two parties are committed to obeying the Bible, if two parties are committed to obeying the Lord in this matter, you could have a wonderful, great marriage. If only one person in the relationship is committed to obeying the Lord, you still have the potential to have a great marriage. 
The Lord didn't guarantee it, but it, the Lord said, if you do your part, we'll get to this. If you do your part, you could still, that could still happen. But woe be to the marriage when both parties have given up on obeying God. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. My job, folks, is to tell you what the Bible says. My job is not to get, make up something that makes you feel good or sounds nice or to give my own spin on it or my own interpretation. My job is to tell you and explain to you what the Bible says. It's not a private interpretation. It says what it says and it means what it means. And I'm not going to pretend that this verse doesn't say what it says and mean what it means. You know, some, there's some passages in the Bible. There's a few passages in the Bible that are controversial because at, they're, very, they're hard to understand. It takes some real study to get the answer. This is not one of those passages. Amen. This is not very hard to understand at all. It's just hard to put it, into, put it into practice and submit to it. Now, before we really get into this, one more thing I'm going to say. Uh, if you're single, you need to pay attention. Um, because it's, this is going to help you in one of two ways. And I hate when people say, oh, this sermon doesn't apply to me, or this part of the Bible doesn't apply to me. Did Jesus say, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God? Then to say that there's a word in here that doesn't apply to you and can't help you is to call Jesus Christ a liar. Because he said you need every word. So I don't care what your situation is in here, this sermon is for you because it's the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So if you're single in here, uh, this will help you in one of two ways. Either you're going to see what's involved in a marriage, and you're going to say, nah, nah, that's, that's not for me. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Or you're going to say, well, that's not for me right now, but maybe one day in the future. Yeah. Or you're gonna, or if you are planning on getting married, and or that time's gonna come along, you're, then guess what? You'll know a little bit of what you're doing when you get into it, and you'll have a little bit of idea of who the kind of person you are you're supposed to be looking for. Amen. First thing I want to say about this passage in chapter three, verse number eighteen it says, "Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as is fit in the Lord." First thing I want to say about this passage is the Lord did not did not write that in chapter 1, verse number 1. He wrote that in chapter 3, verse number 18. You know what that means? That means there's a lot of truth you need to understand before you're really ready to receive this truth. Uh, we, we, in our society, we live, we live in a very instant society. We get almost everything we want instantaneously. Instant meals, and instant dinners, and instant coffee, and oh, there's something I saw on the internet, it's in California. Well, I'll just pay a little extra and have it delivered overnight, it'll be at my doorstep the, the next morning. That's amazing. I mean, we get everything fast. And so that's, that's the way we're used to getting answers. We'll go to the internet, look up anything in the history of the world you want to know about, you'll get an answer. Now, it's not always the right answer, but you'll get an answer. You'll get an answer. And so Christians come to the Bible, and they got their, they got their problems, and they got their questions, and you know, what, you know what they want? They want a verse to answer their problems, to answer all their questions. God didn't give you a verse. He gave you a book. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 1, the Lord told Joshua, This book, this book of the law, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way, thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. The prosperous, successful Christian life doesn't come after reading a verse. It comes from soaking your mind and your heart in the Word of God. Day and night, day and night, week after week, month after month, year after year. Showing up when it's preached. Showing up when it's taught. Hiding it in your heart. Thinking about it. Reading it. Studying it. Amen. And you do that long enough and then it'll, then it'll start having some influence over your everyday life. But people want to, People got a question, and they're too lazy to search the scriptures. They're, stu they're too lazy to study themselves approved unto God, and they want somebody to show them a verse. God didn't give you a verse. He gave you a book. And he said to read it, and he said to study it. And not all your questions are going to be answered in one little, one little verse for the day, and one little chapter. Uh, you, you really want to know some truth, and it's going to take some study. 
And so, He didn't give you these instructions in chapter 1. He gave you these instructions in chapter 3. So, what we're going to do is we're going to get some context. So, go back to chapter 1. You know, in these current times that we live in, most Christians are very lazy when it comes to spiritual things. They really are. I mean, they might, they might be very hardworking when it comes to their secular job because that feeds their belly. But when it comes to spiritual things that feed their soul, uh, that diligence kind of fades away. And passages are not meant to stand alone. A passage has a context within a chapter, and a chapter has a context within a book. You know, the, when the Lord wrote Galatians, He didn't write six chapters and say, oh, well, that's, that's a good place to stop. Well, we'll, uh, we'll make a new title, Ephesians, and pick up there. No, no, no. Each book has specific themes and specific emphases, and if you get that... That will give you help in understanding the details of the book. So, let's get a little understanding of what Colossians is about here. Chapter 1, verse number 1. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice uh, just, just to say, right now, right now, I'm in the will of God. I mean, Paul's writing this letter. He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And the, that wasn't just him saying it. The Holy Spirit uh, told him to write it and put his seal of approval on it. Wouldn't that be good? You're walking so close to the Lord and you, you could just say, right now, right now, I'm in the will of God. Look at verse number 2. It says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Coloss, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's great news, folks. You know what? If a Roman Catholic priest says grace be unto you and peace, well, who cares, man? That don't that mean nothing. But if the Lord said it, that means something. That's encouraging. The, the Lord's got a lot of things to write in the, in the book of Colossians, does He not? The very first thing He says, He says, grace be to you and peace. That's what the Lord's saying to you today. That's what the Lord's saying to me today. The Lord wants your life to be full of grace and full of peace. You need to get this before you get the rest of the book. See, your problem, if you have a... You, people don't really have a problem with anything the Lord wrote in chapter 3. They have a problem with this right here. They're not convinced that the Lord has their best interests at heart. They're not convinced that the things that he wrote in this book are designed to give them grace and peace. The Lord wrote this book. He says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that means? That, that means the things that he wrote in this book are designed to help you to that end. You don't, you don't need to start in chapter 3. You need to start in chapter 1 where God starts. He says, I wrote these things so you could have grace and peace. Look, skip down to verse number uh, 12. You know, you know what the key to the Christian, Christian victorious, and I, I haven't obtained it, but you know what the key to living victorious Christian life is when you finally understand and realize that God's laws and God's instructions are not there to hurt you, they're there to help you. Amen. And when you really believe that and really get that, then now we can go somewhere, now we can take off. Verse number 12 giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I hope when you read that you just don't glaze over it. I hope you really think about what, the, what you just read there. The Bible says that the Lord's made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We weren't meet, but the Lord made us meet. We weren't capable of reaching that, but the Lord made us capable. He made us meet. He, he put us in that position. He says He's delivered us from the power of darkness. You know, you know, right now, without Jesus Christ, every single one of us would be under the influence of the darkness of this world. World. We look out there and we see all those people lost. They don't have a clue about what's going on. They don't know where they came from. They don't know where they're going. Don't ever forget that it was the grace of God that you're saved today. The Lord took you out of darkness and into light. Praise the Lord. He says, and that translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Pastor gave you a tr good translation this morning. Enoch was translated the, that he should not see death. Remember that? Or here's another one. The Lord translated you out of the out of the uh, <clears throat> excuse me out of <laughs> out of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. That's a good translation, isn't it? Yeah. 
How about verse 14? In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Folks, I'm going to tell you something right now. When you, if the Lord tarries and allows you to live into old age, and you're on your deathbed, and you realize that you ain't got much time left, and there's no more life to live, you're going to be mighty thankful that your sins are forgiven. Amen. You're going to be mighty thankful that you're redeemed. You're going to be mighty thankful that you're on your way to heaven, and you know that when you take your last breath, you're not worried about a thing. You're going to see Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, sometimes right now, that seems, a far, that seems far off. It does, because we get caught up in the things of the, the life and the duties and the responsibilities of life. But one day, that's going to be more real than it's ever been real before. One day, you're going to be thankful. You're going to be thankful. Thankful your sins are forgiven. The Bible says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. We got it made. We got it made. Now, life's hard. Life can be very hard. Life can be very difficult. But I'm going to tell you, folks, we got it made. Nothing, in, nothing, no, nothing the government can do can take away what we just read. No, they can, no executive order can be signed says this person no longer has forgiveness of sins. They can't do it. They can't touch it. They can't touch your, in, uh, they can't touch your inheritance. They can't touch your forgiveness. They can't touch your redemption. Nothing in the stock, nothing, nothing the stock market, the stock market does has any bearing on that at all. Nothing you're going to see in the news tomorrow has any effect on that at all. It doesn't matter what happens. You're forgiven. You're redeemed. Now you need to think about that. You need to meditate day and night on that. The Bible says we have redemption. So what's the? What are we doing here? What are we talking about? We're building some. We're laying some groundwork, because when the Lord starts to tell you in chapter three how He wants to live your life, He's not writing from the perspective of how can I ruin their lives. He's writing from the perspective of, look, look at everything I've done for you. I want your life to be blessed. I want to give you grace. I want to give you peace. Look at what I did for you. But you got to get, you got to start at the, where the Lord started. You got to start in chapter one. You can't jump into the middle of the book. I mean, what other book do you do that with? You jump in the middle and say, well, I don't agree with that. Well, why don't you start in the beginning? Look at chapter, look at verse number 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That Bible says that he's the firstborn. You know what that means? That means there's going to be others, but there couldn't be others if He didn't rise from the dead. Amen. You know what? We are going to rise one day because He rose. And He's the head of our church. The pastor's not the head of the church. Uh, the Christ is the head of our church. We take our orders from Him. Now the Lord ordained the pastor, the deacons, all those things, that's well and good. But Christ died for our sins. And He's supposed to be the, the pre, have the preeminence. And He's the head of our, he's the head of our church. And he ought to be the preeminent one in our life. He says in verse number 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross. You have peace with God tonight? Do you? Amen. You know what it costs you? And you know what it costs the Lord? It costs his own blood. His own blood. You ever, you, ever get, you, ever, you ever get your eye on something, you really want it, and then you take a look at the price tag and you say, uh... Nah, not so much. I wanted it, but I didn't want it that bad. I'm not willing to pay that amount. You know, the Lord wanted to save you. And you know, when he, when he found out what it cost, it was going to cost his own blood shed on a cross. You know, he went ahead and did it anyways. Yeah. You know, when he went ahead and paid that price. He's, he's going to that cross. The Bible says in Hebrews, he said, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. What joy? The joy of saving you, saving you, and having fellowship with you for all of eternity. The Lord wanted that. He says in chapter 2, verse number 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. You're complete in Him. The day you got saved, you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified, you are born again, you are born into the family of God. You'll never be more saved than the day you got saved. 
Now, your, your body still got issues, and your walk with the Lord still has issues, but your position, your standing in Christ is settled, sealed forever, and you'll never be any more saved or any more complete than you were the day you got saved. You're complete. You got all the salvation that it, you're ever going to get. Now, we're not talking about the body. You understand. We're talking about your position in Christ. You're never going to be... You know what? Ephesians says you're already in heaven. Ephesians says you're already seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. According to Ephesians, you're already there. Folks, we're already there. Amen. We ought to live like it. We ought to live like it. You're complete. You're complete in Jesus Christ. Verse number 13, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. You know what? Not only did the Lord forgive your sins, and not only did the Lord forgive your trespasses, he blotted out the very law that would have condemned you. The Bible says he nailed it to his cross. You know, the law requires death. The law, the law requires sinners to be killed. And Christ fulfilled the law, and he died in your place. And he died in my place. And the Bible says he nailed it to that cross. Uh, you say, how does that work? I don't know, but I know he did it. I know he did it. So look at chapter 3. Now chapter 3 begins the majority of instruction for how he wants us to live. Right? Chapter 1 and chapter 2 is more mainly about what the Lord did for us and how great Christ is. And now, now after two chapters of that, the Lord says, now are you ready to listen to what I have to say for you? Now are you ready to receive some instruction? See, if you have a problem with anything in chapter 3, you know what you need to do? You need to go back and read chapter 1 and chapter 2. And you need to meditate on what the Lord did for you. And you need to realize that He doesn't have, He's not trying to ruin your life. He's trying to give you a blessed life. And He's trying to give you grace and peace. Another theme, another theme of Colossians is giving thanks. The lady said, said the song today, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, for the church, for the family, for all the blessings, right? Another theme in Colossians is giving thanks. You find that in chapter 1, verse number 3, chapter 1, verse number 12, chapter 2, verse 7. Chap I know I'm going fast. Chapter 3, verse 15, chapter 3, verse 17, chapter 4, verse number 2. Six times, six times in this little four-chapter book, you find thanksgiving. You know why? Because the problem... The problem when people rebel against what he said is because they're not thankful for what he did. He says in chapter 3, verse number 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. You say, what's up there? I don't know, but Christ is. That, that's good enough for me. Verse number 2, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Affection is a, an abiding condition of the heart. It's a settled goodwill, love, or attachment. Now, you can order someone to serve you. You can order them to do some things, but you can't order them to set their affection, right? You can't make them want to. So why does the Lord say, set your affection on things above? Well, he's not writing it from the standpoint of you have to do this. He's writing it from the standpoint of look at all I've done for you. How could you not love Jesus Christ? How could you not want to obey him? How could you not want to do what he wants you to do? Look at everything he's done for you. Folks, isn't it, isn't it always easier to listen to someone uh, if you know they care about you, whether it be, uh, whether it be uh, on, the, on the job at work or in church or whatever the case is? Now, one of the things I appreciate, I think you do too, about Pastor, he, he rakes us over the coals sometimes, doesn't he? I mean, he lets us have it. But you know why we sit there and take it? Because you know he cares about you. Amen. Right? And you know what? Jesus Christ gives some instructions that at first glance, they don't seem very appetizing. And at first look, they don't seem like they're really beneficial, like it would really work. But you know why we ought to listen to him? Because look how much he cares for us. Amen. And look how much he did for us. Right? Chapter 3, look at verse number 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You wouldn't have a life without Christ. 
You would have nothing without them. Look at verse number 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. That's the key right there, folks, right there. Christ is all and in all. He's everything. We wouldn't have anything without Him. He's in all. He ought to be in all your relationships. He ought to be in your career decisions. He ought to be in your finances. He ought to be in your personal life, in your family life. He ought to be in everything. Christ is all and in all. John said, John the Baptist said, He must increase, but I must decrease. His influences over our thoughts must increase. Our flesh's influence must decrease. His influence over our daily lives and our daily actions must increase, and we must decrease. His his will and His direction for us must increase, and ours must decrease. Christ is all. And the reason we have a problem with sin is because Christ is in all. He's only a little compartment over here, or a part of our lives. We need, Christ needs to increase. We need to increase. Christ needs to be all. If Christ was all, there'd be no question. There'd be no questioning about what He wants us to do. Amen. Why should Christ have to explain Himself? Why should Christ have to justify Himself to you? Isn't it enough that, look, He died for you and He did all that for you? We should, be, we should say, Lord, I don't understand everything you say, but if you're going to do all that for me and love me like that, whatever it is, I'm ready to hear it. I'm all ears. I'm all ears, Lord. I'm all ears. Look at verse number 16. Let the Word of Christ... Dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know, Christ is God. The Word of Christ is just another way of saying the Word of God. This is the only time the, the phrase Word of Christ appears in your, appears in your whole Bible. But why, why, why does the Lord use the term Word of Christ here. Why don't he just say word of God? Why does he say word of Christ? Because folks, come on. This is what Christ has to say to you. This is what this isn't just a book. It is, but this is what Christ has to say to you. Look how much he loved you. Look how much he did for you. This is what Christ has to say. We ought to be we ought to be devouring it up. We ought to be ready to ready to hear, ready to put it in the practice. It's the word of Christ. Now, <laughs> Now with all that context, chapter 3, verse number 18. Wives. I'll start with the wives because the Lord started with them. Don't worry, we'll get to the husbands. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. In these verses, the Lord really doesn't give much explanation as to why you should do it. He just says, wives, submit, husbands, love your wives. Not really much of an explanation. You know, in Ephesians chapter 5, there's a, cross, there's a cross reference, a passage, and it pretty much says the same thing, but the Lord goes into detail giving you the picture. He says, look, your marriage relationship pictures the relationship between Christ and the church. And just like the church is supposed to be subject to Christ, so the wife is supposed to be subject to the husband. And he goes into all this explanation and explaining all you need to know about it, right? And Colossians chapter 3 just says to do it. Just do it. Again, why does Christ have to explain Himself? Why should He have to justify Himself? The theme in Colossians is the preeminence of Christ. He's the head of our church. If He's all and in all, because look at everything He's done for us, He shouldn't have to explain Himself. Amen. He shouldn't have to explain Himself. If He says, wives, if He says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, then you, can, you should just say, well, it's the word of Christ. If Christ wants me to do it, then I'll do it for Him. He says, husbands, love your wives. Well, why should I? It doesn't matter. Christ said it. Christ said it. That, that should be all the explanation that you need. Now, when he says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, that doesn't mean a wife doesn't have a brain. <laughs> it doesn't mean she doesn't have anything to contribute. It just means when after the two of you have talked it out, and you've both given your opinions on something, when the husband says, this is the way it's going to be, then that's the way it's going to be. You know what? 
If you if you're a husband, and you don't listen to your wife. It's because you're puffed up and you're proud. Yeah. Uh, Pilate should have should have listened to his wife. Uh, the Pilate's wife warned Pilate, and and, and he, she said she said I've suffered many things today in a dream because of him. She said, "Have thou nothing to do with that just man?" Pilate should have listened to his wife. Yeah. He don't know for sure he's likely in hell today because he didn't heed that command. He didn't heed that advice. You know, Abraham's wife, you know what Sarah said? Sarah said, you know, I can't, the Lord's not really bringing home his promise like he said he would in my timing. Why don't you go into the maid? I mean, we get on Abraham to, for doing it. That was, that was Sarah's idea. You know what? That was the case where Abraham should not have listened to his wife. So, so you know what? If you're the husband, you got the responsibility for the decisions, and you're supposed to have enough spiritual discernment to know when she's given you something right and when she's given you something wrong. It doesn't mean she doesn't have anything to contribute. It doesn't mean that she's never right or you just step all over her. But you're supposed to have enough spiritual discernment to know when to listen and when to not to listen. Right? If a wife's to submit, it doesn't mean she doesn't have anything worth saying. You know, well, we'll, we'll get to it. But he, said, he says in verse 18, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. You know, when the Lord put his, the body of Christ together, he said he fitly, he fitly joined it together. That's Ephesians 4.16. In Ephesians chapter 2, he, he, he likens the body of Christ to a building which is fitly fitly framed together. You know what he did? He put the body of Christ, he joined it member to member as he saw fit. And first Corinthians, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible says there's one body but many members, right? They don't all have the same office, they don't all have the same gifts, they don't all have the same uh, abilities and talents, and but the Lord said that's okay. They're not all supposed to be the same. They're all supposed to function in the way I wanted them to function. And when we come to church, we're, the Lord wants us to each use our own gift. You know, if it was, I'm not, I'm not proud about this. I'm just saying, if it was, if if this building maintenance was up to me, the place would fall apart in six months. I don't say that like I'm proud about it. I'm just, it's just a fact. The place would, the place would fall apart. Thank God we got men that know what they're doing, know how to fix this place, right? And look, some people are more gifted in one area, and some people are more gifted in another area. Some people really, they're really good at helping. They really, they're really good at seeing a need and, uh, and, and going to meet that need. I'm trying to work on that. First, I got to recognize when there's a need, and then I can work on meeting that need. But you know what? That's not an excuse. We all got, all, all got to do our best. But some people are more gifted than others. And you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Lord says, no member, no member is more important than, the all, uh, and then, than any other member. They just have different places they fit in the body. As long as everybody is doing what God enabled them to do, the thing runs great. Amen. But the problem comes in with the, when the foot says, well, I want to be the hand. And the ear says, well, I want to be the eye. And the Lord says, that's not what I made you to do. That's not how I made you to fit together in the body. And the Lord says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Your husband didn't put you in that position. No preacher put you in that position. The Lord put you in that position. And it doesn't, no, the, nobody's saying the husband's better. Nobody's saying the wives are not important. That's not the thing at all. The, the Bible says you'll be happiest functioning in the position that I put you in. If the, if the Lord said, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, then that's where you fit, and that's where you'll be happiest doing. And the husbands, if the Lord told you to love your wife, then that's where you fit, and that's what you'll be happiest doing. And every, as long as everybody's doing their part, the thing works great. Verse number 19. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Husbands have a real bad habit of blaming their, blaming their wife when things go wrong. Uh, it's been that way since the Garden of Eden. Adam said, the woman, the woman which thou gavest to be with me, uh, she ate of the tree and she gave it to me. I mean, he's blaming the Lord, but he's also blaming the woman. He's also blaming his wife. 
You know, sir, if you're going to pull out the I'm the head of the home card when you want your way, uh, then you better pull that same card out when things go wrong, too. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to beat your chest and say, I'm the head of the house, well, then when that house runs into the ground, then you better take responsibility for that, too. You better take credit for that, too. You can't just take all the glory when things go well and then blame your wife when things go wrong. I mean, if you're in charge, you're in charge. Right? There's responsibility and accountability that goes with that leadership. And he says, John, in John chapter 16, verse number 22, the Bible says that no, no one can take away your joy. No one can take away your joy. The, the, the Bible says, don't be bitter against them. Uh, love, joy, peace, you know what all that is? That's fruit of the Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to produce in your life and in your heart. So if you don't have any joy in your heart, and if you don't have any peace or any love or any long-suffering or any gentleness or any goodness, why are you blaming someone else? The Lord says, I could produce that in you and in your heart if you'd submit to the Holy Spirit. So your wife's not the problem, your heart's the problem. And you need to examine your own heart and your own life to see what's going on with me. What's going on with me? You know, ruling is not just about bossing people around. It's about taking responsibility. It's about making sure everybody's supplied with all that they need, both spiritually and physically. You know, probably, probably there's not a day go by. Let's, let's all be honest tonight. There's probably not a day that goes by when we don't sin in some way, whether it's in deed or in thought or in action or in motive or something. Probably, probably not a day. Probably not a day goes by. That's being generous too. Probably, probably not a day that goes by when we don't sin. And you know what? Not one time has the Lord ever stopped loving you. If, 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 your, if the Lord's love for you was based on your merit and my merit, we have been kicked to the curb a long time ago. Yeah. And the Lord's never turned you away. And the Lord never said, oh, I wish I never saved that guy. He's been nothing but trouble to me. Praise the Lord. Amen. Right? So don't demand any more of your wife than you demand of yourself. Don't be a hypocrite about it. Don't say the Lord, don't go to the Lord and say, thank you for always loving me. Thank you for always being there for me no matter what I do. And the littlest thing your wife does, you're on her about it. Well, we're supposed to work both ways. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Look at verse number 18. At the end of the verse it says, as, is fit, as it is fit in the Lord. End of verse 20. This is well pleasing unto the Lord. Uh, verse, end of verse 22. In singleness of heart, fearing God. Verse 23. Do it heartily as to the Lord. Verse 24. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. In all these verses, you know what the focus is? The focus is not on the other person you're dealing with. The focus is on the Lord. If you're unwilling to obey these verses, it shows more about your relationship to the Lord than it does about the person you're dealing with. In all, in all these verses, the focus is on the Lord. You do it because the Lord wants you to do it. You do it because you serve the Lord. He's your Lord. He's your master. See, see, we all want to make it about our husband or our wife. The Lord says, no, it's about the Lord. It's about you and me, you and the Lord. The Bible says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to the Lord. The husband's going to give an account uh, to the Lord by himself about how well he obeyed his verse. And the wife's going to give an account to the Lord herself of how she obeyed her verse. Notice in none of these verses, it, it doesn't say... Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as long as your husband is exactly like Christ. It doesn't say husbands love your wives as long as she's always in submission to you. It, it never gives you an out to say, well, if that person's not doing their part, then I don't have to do their part. No, you have to do your part regardless because you serve the Lord. It's not, see, now I don't have multiple children yet, but I grew up with a sister who was really close in age to me. And how many, how many times is the excuse for disobeying, well, he said this, or she did this, or look at what she did. And you know what, you know what a good, you know what our parents say, you know what a good parent says? 
I don't care what they did. I don't care what she said. You're responsible for you. You're not responsible for what the other person did. You're responsible for you. And how many times, how many times does someone want to blame their lack of obedience to the Lord on their spouse? It's not about your spouse. It's about you obeying the Lord. He says, go to, we'll come back here. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Now, I've, I'm just being honest, honest with you folks. My wife makes it easy for me. She's a great wife. I just, I'm not being funny. But she really is. And I know some of these things are, are very hard sometimes, but they need to be said because they're true. And I, I say it as lovingly as I know how, but I also say it as truthfully as I know how. In Matthew chapter 5, verse number 43, the Bible says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father. So how much time do you spend praying for Him? That, might, that might, might do some good. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for He maketh His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only... What do ye more than others? <laughs> do not even the publicans the same? Uh, also, uh, so? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You know, you know what the Lord just said? If you treat others the way that you're treated, any lost heathen public can do that. Doesn't, you don't need the indwelling Holy Spirit. You don't need a Bible. You don't need preaching. Any old publican can treat others the same way they're being treated. Right? So, our excuse, our conduct, why is our conduct based on what the other person is doing? Are you telling me that the Lord's given you His Holy Spirit? He's saved you. He's given you a complete Bible. He's given you Christian friends and preachers and teachers. And you can't do any better than a publican. You can't do any better than a heathen. All your ability goes no farther than to do the same thing as the person does to you. I hope that's not our testimony. I hope we've learned a little bit about the Lord. You know, the Bible says when Christ was reviled, He reviled not again. He threatened not. He opened not His mouth. He says, I've done this as your example, that you should follow my steps. Anybody, look folks, we can all be nice to people who are nice to us. And we can all be mean to people who are mean to us. And the Lord says, don't you think I deserve a little better than that? Go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Uh, sir, the fact that your wife is not in submission to you is not an excuse for you not to love her. Doesn't hold any, it might hold water with the counselors of the world. doesn't hold any water with the Lord. And ma'am, just because your husband's not everything the Lord, he's the Lord, what he's supposed to be, doesn't relieve you of your responsibility to submit. It goes both ways. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse number 9. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold, cold, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. The Bible says in verse number 10, Woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. So when your husband or your wife fails to be what they're supposed to be. You know what your responsibility is? Amen. Your responsibility is to help them up. Amen. When your husband is not the way he's supposed to be, 
man, that's your husband. That's your opportunity to just be as sweet as possible to him. Not with the idea of this will really get him. <laughs> no, but genuinely, because that's what the Lord called you to do. And same thing, same thing for you guys when your wife is displaying a lack of willingness to go along with the program. That's your opportunity to help her up and treat her just as nicely and just as sweet as you ever did. You know, Christ, Christ wants to hold the marriage together. Doesn't matter if you're saved, lost, Christ wants to hold the marriage together. You know who wants to divide it? That would be the devil. That would be the devil. He's the enemy of your marriage, not the Lord. And so when one of you falls, you got to decide whose side you're going to take, Christ or the devil's. Because Christ wants to help the other person up. And the devil wants to kick them when they're down. And you got to decide which side you're going to join. The Bible says a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That would be an application. That would be you and your spouse and Christ if you're saved. And Christ is what holds that thing together. And Christ is the center of it. He's all and He's in all and He has the preeminence. You know what Pastor was talking this morning? He's, he's talking about, well, the answer to everything is Jesus Christ, right? And uh, he said, well, all your answer for everything is Jesus Christ, right? And it is, it is. And you know what, you, you know what the answer for your marriage problem, marriage problem is? It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. It's loving Him. And uh, this, this, this sermon is, is for all marriages, this is not directed at bad marriages. It's not directed at good marriages. It's directed all, at all marriages. Because just because you got a good marriage right now is no guarantee you're going to have a good marriage five years from now or a year from now. You know what? Hebrews chapter 2 verse number 1 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. And we all have a tendency to let things slip, don't we? Uh, once we've accomplished something, once we've done something, then we get real careless about keeping that and maintaining that. If you ever had a good marriage and it's not now, well, what did you do that got you to that point? You need to do that again. Don't assume that if everything's going well now, it's just always going to go along that way. Good works require maintenance. Go back to Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. The point, I hope I'm explaining it clearly. The point I'm driving, trying to drive home to you is these things are your, these things are really your relationship to Christ. That's what's in view. Your relationship to your husband or your wife or your children or your work relationships, whatever the case may be, that's an opportunity to show your love for Christ. That's an opportunity to serve Christ. It's about Him. The Bible says in verse 23, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily. <laughs> okay, we were good up to this point, right? <laughs> Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men. So, if you if you got kids, or if or if you ever were a kid, that should cover everyone. <laughs> then you know the difference between your kid and your your child doing their chores because they were made to, and doing it because they really want to help mom and dad. There's, they did the same thing, but one's a lot different. One's a lot better than the other. And the Lord said, I don't want you to just keep the letter of the law. I want you to put your heart into it. Now, it would be unreasonable, <clears throat> it would be unreasonable for the Lord to ask that if only man was in view. It, it would. But he said, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. As to the Lord and not unto men. Um, the Lord is not asking you to do this for your husband or your wife. If you can, praise the Lord. That's a great thing. That's the goal. But you could do it for Christ, couldn't you? You could do it for the Lord, couldn't you? Remember chapter 1, chapter 2. Don't forget. Don't forget where we started. You could do it for Christ. He's worth it. 
verse 24, Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. If you do what the Lord told you to do, then the Lord will reward you for doing that. He's the one you serve. He's the one you're going to stand before and give an account of. Look at verse number 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. So the objection is, oh, what about those who abuse their authority? The Lord's way ahead of you. He's way ahead of you. He already said, that's not your job, that's my job. He said, I will take care of those who do wrong. That's not your area of responsibility. The Bible says, I'll take care of that. Nobody's getting away with anything. But you just do what I told you to do. Now, what's the key to all this? It's being spiritually minded. It's setting your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Right? We begin in the chapter. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Because if all you can see is the earth, but you can't see eternity, and you can't see the judgment seat of Christ, this is never going to make sense to you. It's never going to make sense. And you know what? The Lord wants to make your marriage a great one. And depending on both parties, that may or may not happen. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to say if you do your part, the Lord promised that the other person, I'm not going to lie to you. The Lord said if you do your part, that's the best chance you have of making it work. That's 1 Peter chapter 3. We don't have time to look at that. That's your best chance. And that's the best hope you have of making it the best marriage it can be. I'm not going to lie to you. But the Lord says, I hope it's worth it now. But I can tell you, I can tell you when you stand before me, yeah. it will be worth it. It will be worth it all when we see Christ. Amen. When we see Christ. Maybe not before then. But it will be worth it when we see Christ. He says it's going to be worth it for all of eternity. What the Lord is trying to show us through this passage is that our obedience to these things reveal our, our relationship to the Lord. Our relationship to Jesus Christ. The Lord never asked you to trust your husband. He never did. Not one time. He never asked you to trust your husband. He never asked you to trust your wife. He said, trust me and do what I told you to do. And he says, he says it's your relationship to me is what we're talking about here. It's the Lord. It's Christ. It's him. So what do we need? We need Christ to be all. We need Christ to be all and in all. That's what we need. Father, thank you for an opportunity to stand up here. I pray it would be a help uh, to your folks, uh, your saints, Lord, and your dear children. Thank you for the people that made the effort to come out tonight. Lord, if there's any one of us, Lord, that need help in these things, I pray you'd minister to them, to us, as we need it. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymnals, please. Turn to number 177. If you need to talk to the Lord, the altar is open. Number 177. Great is thy faithfulness.